here is probably close to the very top of my favorites of all time. Beautiful. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to all of those who are tuning in and who are watching us through Facebook Live. We just want to thank you and uh, again, we wish we could be here together in person, but hopefully things will open back up soon. Until then, we will continue worshiping God by any means we can. We know according to prophecy that uh, the religious freedom that we hold here in America will not always be the way that it is. Soon we will be meeting at disclosed locations and giving messages behind closed doors. So I guess this is just a glimpse and a little bit of practice for what's coming. But I pray that even in the midst of this, we will remain faithful. That we will not skip out on Sabbath, that we will not skip out on studying. If anything, we need to be studying more at this time. Amen? I just want to take this time to invite you, anyone who is listening, to tune back in at 5 p.m. this evening for SAS. SAS, for those who don't know, is Sabbath afternoon study. We have a lot of good messages, a lot of good studies. And this evening, we we will have a very powerful message that God has laid upon my heart. It's entitled, Watchmen, What of the Night? But this morning's message is entitled, Victory. Victory. And before we go any further, I'm going to ask that we have a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for waking us up, for giving us another day. Lord, we thank you for bringing us safely through another week to this Sabbath day. Father, we thank you for these sacred hours. And we pray that we would learn to jealously guard even the edges of your Sabbath. Forgive us if we've said, done, or thought anything that was displeasing to you this Sabbath day. Bless us and guide us. Father, we pray that this message will be straight from your throne. Hide me behind your cross. Speak through me. And Lord, uh, as was already said, I just pray that this will be your message and not my own. May our hearts and minds be open to receive it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, the message this morning is entitled Victory. I'm going to ask if you have your Bibles to turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, a well-known verse. Many of us know this verse well. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, and the Word of God tells us, And there was what? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. We know the outcome of this battle. Satan didn't even have a chance to win. Therefore, he was cast out and all of the angels who followed him were cast out with him. But ever since this war broke out in heaven, God's people have continually been at war ever since. There has never been a time of peace for God's true followers. All throughout history, from this war in heaven, there has been warfare amongst God's people. There was war between Cain and Abel. There was war between Cain's descendants and the descendants of Seth. There has always been war between the faithful and those who were unfaithful to God. There is no exception. In the book Upward Look, page 77, paragraph 3, it says, Enmity between truth and falsehood had existed ever since the fall of Satan. The being who now works so constantly to sow the seeds of error once occupied one of the most exalted positions in the heavenly courts. But he was not satisfied with his position. He determined to be more highly exalted and worked to further his ambitions, his ambitious projects, until there was war in heaven. So we're told again in the spirit of prophecy, emphasizing the fact that ever since this war took place in heaven, there has continually been war between truth and error. Now, the Bible makes one thing very clear to us. The Bible tells us over and over that there is a time and place for all things under the sun. Amen? There is always a time and season for everything. We're turning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we'll look at verse 1. And the Word of God tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heavens. You see, there is a time and season for all things. And many of us, when we view Christianity, we look at it as 
meekness, lowliness of heart, lowliness of mind, humility. And friends, while all of these things play a very important role to the Christian walk, there is also a time to stand up and to war. If we jump down to verse 8, it says, A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. You know, when we read this, it may seem contrary to some minds that there would be a time to hate in the Christian walk. But friends, there are things that as Christians we have to hate. You see, when we learn to love the things of righteousness, we must learn to also hate the things that go against righteousness. We must learn to hate sin and the things that has caused God and his son so much pain. There is a time and place even for war. You see, the things, when we come to Christ, the things that we once loved, we begin to hate. And the things that we once hated, we begin to love. God begins to work in the character to transform the man who receives the gospel. We're told in Acts of the Apostles, page 476, paragraph 3. Once again, Acts of the Apostles, 476, paragraph 3. He who has determined to enter the spiritual kingdom will find that all the powers and passions of unregenerate nature backed by the forces of the kingdom of darkness, are arrayed against him. Notice that he is at war with himself. The things within him are only backed by the kingdoms of darkness. You see, Satan is not your greatest enemy. Self is your greatest enemy. Because Satan can only tempt you on what is already in you. Therefore, we must wage a relentless war with self. It goes on to say, each day he must renew his consecration. Each day he must do battle with evil. Old habits, hereditary tendencies to wrong, will strive for the mastery. And against these, he is to ever be on guard, striving in Christ's strength for the victory. Now I want to emphasize that last part. We are to strive in Christ's strength for the victory. We cannot do it in our own strength. But because Christ offers us his strength, it does not do away with the fact that we still have a part that we need to strive in. Amen? As Alan White emphasizes again in the book, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 381, paragraph 4, she says, you are your greatest enemy. You are are your greatest enemy. Satan's not our greatest enemy again. Satan can only tempt us on what is already in us. As Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh unto me and has found nothing in me. In other words, when Satan came with his temptations, he found that Christ had no links in the chain for him to bind him to sin. Desire of Ages, page 306, paragraph 1. While those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, those who cling to sin war against the truth and its representatives. I hope you caught that. I'm going to read it again. While those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, those who cling to sin War against the truth and its representatives. This statement right here alone explains why there's continually war in the church. You see, there has been a constant warfare against present truth and those who preach victory over sin. And people are rising up and starting to say that we will be sinning until Jesus comes. Friends, you can choose to believe that if you want. And you can continue sinning until Jesus comes if you so choose. But do not expect to reign with him in glory if you hold on to your sins. Because nothing that defiles shall enter into that kingdom. The time to make war against sin is now. The transformation of character must be wrought in us now. For no transformation will take place at Christ's coming except 
for the transformation of this vile mortal body putting on immorality. Now, as far as character goes, we will take the character that we have formed on this earth with us. And if that character is not fit for the kingdom, we will not be amongst that kingdom. Again, those who choose to cling to sin. You see, some are too busy warring with self to worry about everyone else and to wage war against them and what they're preaching. But when we don't war against self, we will be warring against something. And that something will be the truth and those who represent it. It says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 50, paragraph 4, If they do not gain the victory over sin, then sin is gaining the victory over them. What we do not overcome will in turn overcome us and work out our own destruction. It's a very solemn work of overcoming every sin. And again, I want to emphasize that this is not something that we are humanly able to do in our own strength. It takes a striving in Christ's power and in his strength to overcome all of these sins. I want to turn to a very familiar passage we all know so well. We're turning to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 14. Daniel chapter 8. And looking at verse 14. The Word of God tells us in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And friends, if there were one verse that we could say is a pillar to Adventism, this one verse is it. And they said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. You see, William Miller started a very systematic way of studying the Word of God. He had his concordance and his Bible in hand, and he went verse by verse through the Bible, beginning in the book of Genesis. And any time he came across a passage of Scripture that he did not fully and clearly understand, he'd go to the concordance and he'd look for verses that helped to explain that one verse. And friends, there's a lot that we can learn when it comes to the study of God's Word. There's a lot we can learn from William Miller, and we should apply those same principles to our own study habits. If we do not understand the Scripture, we need to find the Scriptures that unlock these Scriptures and allow the Scripture to interpret itself. Amen? Many today put their own interpretation upon the Word of God, and they are led into all kinds of error. The Apostle Peter warned us that there are many who wrestle with the Scriptures to their own destruction. But we must allow the Scripture to interpret itself. And when he particularly got to this one verse in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, William Miller was very intrigued by this verse. He, he stood back and he says, I have to understand what this means. And as he began to study, things began to open up to his mind. And he, it says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And through his study, he began to realize that these 2,300 days are equal to 2,300 years prophetically. And we as Adventists know this, that the judgment hour or this cleansing of the sanctuary began on October 22, 1844. For those of you who are listening who do not understand how we got to that date, please contact us. I'd be glad, or anyone else in the church will be glad to explain to you how we got to that date particularly from the scriptures themselves. We allowed the Bible to interpret itself to get to that date, amen? So if you don't understand that, please contact us. But unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. October 22nd, 1844, Jesus stepped into the most holy place and began the work of cleansing the sanctuary. Now the question needs to be asked, why does the sanctuary need to be cleansed in the first place? If Jesus walked into the sanctuary to begin the act of cleansing, now we're talking of a, of a sanctuary in heaven. Everything is perfect in heaven. Why would a sanctuary in heaven need to be cleansed? The answer is given us in the Old Testament of 
Leviticus chapter 16. We're turning to Leviticus chapter 16 and beginning in verse 16. Leviticus chapter 16 and beginning in verse 16. The word of God says in Leviticus 16 and verse 16, And he, speaking of the high priest, shall make an atonement for the holy place. In other words, he's making an atonement for the sanctuary. Why? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation, that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. Now notice the purpose of the cleansing of the sanctuary. You see, the high priest was to make an atonement for the holy place because the sanctuary had been defiled. And it says, because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. So in other words, because of our uncleanliness, because of our transgression, because of our sin, our sins have defiled the sanctuary, and makes necessary the work of cleansing that sanctuary. Amen? Moving on in verse 17, it says, And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, until he come out, and have made an atonement for himself, and for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. Notice the atonement was not just for the sanctuary, but also for the entire congregation of Israel. We'll come back to that. Verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and take the blood of a bullock and the blood of a goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. So again, he's cleansing it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. Now question, if it was the children of Israel who made the sanctuary necessary to be cleansed, if it was their uncleanliness that caused the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary to become necessary in the first place, that would mean that God not only has to clean his sanctuary, he has to clean up his people as well. But the question is, what must he clean first? If the people are continually dirtying the sanctuary, and the sanctuary must be cleansed, then Christ has to clean his people before he could have a truly clean sanctuary. Are you following me? Friends, we are diving into the heart of Adventism when we touch the sanctuary message. And if we jump down to verse 30, notice what it says. Verse 30 makes it so clear. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. You see, the day of atonement was not simply about cleansing the sanctuary, but it was about the people walking away, cleansed and renewed through the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Christ that was shed on our behalf. Amen? We're told in the book, Patriots and Prophets, page 355. Patriots and Prophets, 355. Please listen carefully to this. In the sin offerings presented during the year, a substitute had been accepted in the sinner's stead, but the blood of the victim had not made full atonement for the sin. It had only provided a means by which the sin was transferred to the sanctuary. You see, in the Old Testament sanctuary service, anytime somebody sinned on a regular daily basis, I'm speaking about every day besides the Day of Atonement. When somebody committed a sin, they'd come, they'd bring their innocent lamb, and they would confess over the head of that animal. They'd put their hands on the head, they confessed their sins, and in doing that, their sin was transferred to that animal. Once they had confessed their sins and their sins were symbolically transferred from them to that innocent lamb, the priest would then hand them a knife and they knew what they must do. They were to slit the throat of that innocent lamb and to capture the blood. Now, the blood was symbolic of the life of that animal because we know that the wages of sin is death. So by that innocent animal shedding its blood and its, my sins had been transferred into that animal, 
Now, my sins go to that animal and then are transferred into the blood, and then the priest would take that blood into the sanctuary and sprinkle it into the sanctuary. Therefore, the substitute for my sins had not blotted out my sins. They had only provided a means by which my sins could then be carried into the sanctuary and transferred into the sanctuary to be blotted out at a later date. Are you following me? That's why it became necessary on the Day of Atonement to blot out all those sins that had accumulated in the sanctuary. You see, every time we sin and confess that sin, that sin is transferred to the sanctuary to be dealt with. And as I mentioned, if God will ever have a clean sanctuary and be able to step out of that sanctuary to come back to take his people home, he must first clean his people so that we stop defiling the sanctuary so he can finally get it clean and come back for us. Amen? You see, imagine if you were an office worker and your boss came with a stack of papers and said, go through these papers and go through everything and I want you to mark everything. And you're going through and you're down to the last couple sheets of paper. And then all of a sudden somebody walks in with another stack and dumps it. Well, you thought you were almost done, but now you got another stack. This is what's happening on a daily basis because of our sins. Because we're sinning and confessing, these sins are accumulating in the sanctuary. And before Jesus can completely blot them all out, he must have a clean people. He must cleanse his people in order to cleanse that sanctuary. Amen? You see, the Bible makes this clear in 1 Timothy. We're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Powerful verse. I encourage us all to memorize this one. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 24. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 24. Notice what the Word of God says. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 24. The Word of God says here in verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And some men, they follow after. What this verse is saying is that when we confess our sins... By God's grace, because of his shed blood, those sins are able to go beforehand. They're able to be transferred from me to the sanctuary beforehand to go into the judgment to be blotted out. But those who do not confess their sins, when probation closes, their sins will follow after them and will remain on record to condemn them in the judgment. You see, we have the choice, friends, now of either confessing our sins and allowing our sins to go beforehand into the judgment or to allow those sins to remain on record and to follow after us. Notice the way Alan White speaks of this in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 264. She says, I warn all who profess the name of Christ to closely examine themselves and make full and thorough confession of all their wrongs that they may go beforehand to judgment and that the recording angel may write pardon opposite their names. You see, if we allow our sins to go beforehand into the judgment, we can allow Christ to deal with those sins and the recording angel can write pardon next to that record of sins. But if we allow those record of sins to accumulate when probation closes, if we still have unconfessed sins on record, that seals our destruction. And there is no time any longer to repent once probation closes. In the book of Malachi, let us turn there, Malachi chapter 3. You see, as was mentioned, every time we sin and we confess that sin, those sins are transferred to the sanctuary to be dealt with. And Christ, at this very time, is dealing with that sin. He is going through this process of dealing with sin. You see, many of us look at sin because sin is, you know, something you, we usually do. It's, it's an event. We commit the sin, and then we go on and, oh, well, you know, I fell again. Let me confess. But you see, your sin may be a very quick event. It may happen quickly and you may repent just as quickly as you committed it. You may confess it just as quickly as you committed it. But let me tell you something. Dealing with sin 
and getting rid of sin is a much longer process than simply committing a sin and confessing it. There's a lot of steps to the process. And the sanctuary makes this process very clear. And one thing that the sanctuary emphasizes over and over is our need for victory over every sin and defilement of character. That's the reason why Satan has unrelentlessly attacked this sanctuary doctrine and the sanctuary message, because he wants people to be deceived to think that they can enter the courts of heaven with unconfessed sins. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. The word of God says, Behold, I will send my messenger, speaking of Christ, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who shall abide the day of his coming? Now notice, verse 1 is emphasizing that he's not coming back to this earth in these passages, but he is coming to his temple. In other words, he is transferring from the holy place to the most holy place. Are you following me? This is a prophetic statement. It says in in verse 2, the question is asked, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Amen? You see, when Jesus was to come into his temple, when he was to begin his work of purifying the sanctuary, he was also to sit as a refiner of the sons of Levi. Now, who were the sons of Levi? They were priests. They were priests that were to serve God in a sanctuary. They were to do these things. The priesthood had been given to the Levites. Now, why does it emphasize the cleansing of the children of Levi? Well, friends, we are told that we are a royal generation, a holy priesthood unto God. Amen? You see, we are the children of Israel. We are the sons of Levi. We are a royal priesthood unto God. And if we will stand in his kingdom, we must allow the process of cleansing to be made in our lives even now that we may stand before his throne without spot or wrinkle or any such thing when he shall return to take us home. Amen? In Great Controversy, page 425, Great Controversy, 425, those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. I want to emphasize that part. Through, <clears throat> excuse me, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. Now, let one thing be clear to our minds. The grace of God does not do away with our need of diligent effort on our part. Again, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification of putting a way of sin amongst God's people upon the earth. You see, God is giving us an opportunity now to put away our sins. The things that are taking place in the earth around us are simply to remind us that children, I am coming soon to take you home. God is telling us, I want you to be ready, and now I want you to search your heart to see where you stand with me. And in doing so, put away these sins that so easily befall you. 
You see, we all have things that we struggle with. We all have our, our weaknesses of, of character. We all have our defects. We all have our sins. But friends, the grace of God is stronger than any sin that we may struggle with. And when we take a hold of the grace of God and we combine it with our own diligent effort and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we can be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. You see, as was mentioned at the beginning of this message, God's people have ever been at war since that war broke out in heaven. But with war also comes victories. With war also comes defeats. But friends, we serve a master who knows no defeat. Jesus Christ has never lost a battle in any of his war or any of his warfare against Satan. He has never lost a battle. And when we are on Christ's sides and we have Christ abiding within us, he being our perfect example can lead us on from victory unto victory. And we too can know no defeat. Amen? You know, I praise God for that victory. But again, I want to look at just a couple of statements here. Give me one second to pull these up on my iPad. Just want to look at a couple of statements about what the spirit of prophecy tells us of the need of cooperation. In Mind, Character, and Personality, Book 2, page 757, we are told <clears throat> always, how often? Always. The Lord gives the human agent his work. Here is the divine and human cooperation. You see, success comes from that divine and human cooperation. We're going to see something in just a minute and make this very practical as to how we can have this experience in our lives. Always the Lord gives the human agent his work. Here is the divine and human cooperation. There is the man working in obedience to divine light given. If Saul had said, Lord, I am not at all inclined to follow your specified directions to work out my own salvation, then, the Lord, then should the Lord have given ten times the amount of light and allowed it to shine upon Saul? it would have been useless. If Saul was not willing to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling, then if God had given him ten times the amount of light, it would have availed nothing. Because, friends, we must live up to the light that God has given us. Amen? There's no point in having a whole bunch of head knowledge if we don't allow it to reach and penetrate the heart and to make a difference in our practical lives. Amen? We are told in Desire of Ages, page 311. Desire of Ages, 311, paragraph 2. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. You see, many of us have brought into this gospel of partial redemption. But as Ellen White says, to be almost saved is to be wholly lost. But we brought into this gospel of a, of a partial restoration to the image of God. I reflect Christ in the way I give tithe. You know, I, I don't hold back my tithe. I, I, I reflect him. But, you know, it's just that one little sin that nobody knows about. Surely that's not a big deal. It's just a small thing. Friends, we either reflect the image of Christ fully, who had no sin in him, or we don't reflect him at all. Many of us, without actually admitting it or saying it with our words, by our own actions and by our own train of thought, put more power on Satan's gospel than on God's gospel. You see, Satan's gospel is, you should not surely die. Go ahead, live a life of sin and lasciviousness. God loves you so much, he'll still open his kingdom to you. He'll still open the gates of heaven to you. Just go on sinning. Everything's going to be fine. That is the devil's gospel, friends. And many of us believe more and put more faith and trust in Satan's gospel than in the gospel and grace of God himself, who can give us power to overcome every sin and every defect of character. Amen? The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. 
Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. There's never an if or but about it. If we are contrite, if we are sincere, and we are pleading with God and doing our part to overcome sin, the promise is that Christ will always separate the contrite soul from sin. There's no need to question that. That is a promise from the prophet of the Lord. Amen? Do we believe in the spirit of prophecy? Many of us are beginning to question the authority of Alan White's writings in our, in our theology and in our teaching. And we're referring to our writings as well as good for devotional purposes, but surely we, <clears throat> we can't allow her to shape our theology. Friends, let me tell you something. The same spirit moved upon the writings of Alan White as moved upon the prophets who wrote the Bible. The last time I checked, there was no levels to inspiration. You're either inspired of God or you're not. Jeremiah is no less inspired than Isaiah the prophet. The minor prophets are no less inspired than the major prophets. Are you following me? You know, when John the Baptist spoke and he, and he preached of Jesus and he, he spoke of these things, Jesus said that when they rejected the words of John the Baptist, they rejected the words of God. And the last time I checked my Bible, there was no book written by John the Baptist. We have the Apostle John, but where's a book in the Bible that was written by John the Baptist? There is no book in the Bible by John the Baptist, but what he said was just as much the Word of God as what was included in the canon. Are you following me? So people will say, well, because Alan White wasn't in the canon, she's less inspired. Let me tell you something. The same spirit moved upon her. And when they say that she is the lesser light that points to the greater light, guess what? John the Baptist was also a lesser light pointing to the greater light who was Christ himself. We, through our own human in, in understanding and interpretation, try and misinterpret that statement from Alan White to say that she was the lesser light pointing to the Bible being the greater light. Her writings are equal to the Bible. And I challenge you to show me otherwise if you don't believe that. Friends, when we reject a prophet of the Lord, we are rejecting the words of the Lord himself, and we're in as grave danger as if we took this book, the Bible itself, and burned it. When we reject counsel from God, whether it's through the writings of Alan White or through the prophets in the canon, the word of God, though equal, when we reject it, we're still rejecting God, not the prophet. It goes on to say, Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. So not only is God interested in giving us victory over sin now, he's not only wanting to take away the sins that we are struggling with now, but he wants to give us the power through his Holy Spirit to keep us from sinning in the future. Amen? That right there, my friends, is the true power of the gospel. The everlasting gospel that that first angel comes to pronounce is a gospel of complete victory over sin, not sin and confess, sin and confess. That is a sad and weak gospel. That is a gospel that we want no part of because it's not the gospel of God. It's a counterfeit gospel. As Paul warned us, he says, I'm shocked at how quickly you have turned from the true gospel to another gospel, but then he goes on to say, but it is not another, another gospel because there's only one true gospel. But there are many perversions of that true gospel, amen? And the thought that we can continue in sin and still be in God's kingdom is a gross perversion of the power and gospel of God. It is, it is a slap to the face of God to say that sin is more strong, sin is more powerful than his power to redeem us from it. Lord, have mercy. There's a reason Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith on the earth? Do we really believe in the power of God to give us victory? You see, many of us put more faith in our personal experience than we put in the Word of God. The Word of God promises that we could have victory over sin, but because we haven't experienced that victory, we say it must not be possible because I haven't experienced it. Well, the question is, how much do we believe this Word? Faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. So if I'm struggling with sin, guess what? I need to spend more time in the word and acquaint myself with the precious promises that have been given to help me to overcome sin. And as I spend more time acquainting myself with those promises, as I just said, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm also increasing my faith in those promises to believe and to apply them to my life that I may have victory. So the underlying root of all unbelief and sin is perhaps that we are not spending enough time in God's word. You see, there was a time when the Adventist church was a lot purer than it is now. We look at the condition of it now. It's not what it once was. But we are told that it shall be restored to primitive godliness before Jesus comes. Amen? And you see, if we look at those times when the, word, when, the, when the church was a lot pure, what were they doing differently? We were known as the people of the book. Now we're known as the people of Facebook. Perhaps if we shifted our focus and got back in the word, it may begin to purify our lives and we may begin to look like the remnant that we are supposed to. Amen? You see, Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, 27. Ephesians 5 and verse 27. What does the word of God tell us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27? That he might present, to, present it, speaking of the church, that he might present it to himself. Excuse me. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, God is coming back. And when he comes back for his people, he is looking for a people, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we may be holy and without blemish. And as somebody mentioned not long ago from this pulpit, as they were looking at the same verse, they said, how is it that we remove a wrinkle from a garment? Heat must be applied. And many times God allows the trials, he allows the judgments to fall in order to apply heat that those wrinkles and those spots may be removed from his people. Amen? You see, what's going on right now is God allowing heat to be applied to us that these wrinkles, that these spots, that these defects may be removed from our lives. So don't complain when we go through trials, but rather praise God that he sees something in us worth saving. Because when I look at myself, I say, Lord, why would you even bother trying to save me? But when I look to Christ and I see how sufficient his grace is for me, I can say God still sees something in me worth saving, that he would take his time to put me through these trials in order to bring something precious out of me. Amen? You see, it's, it says here again, but that, he should, but that it should, the church again, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We are to be holy and without blemish, and this language is picked up again in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 5. Revelation 14 and verse 5. In Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 5, the word of God tells us, And in their mouth shall be found no guile, for they are without fault, or in other words, they are without blemish before the throne of God. Friends, God will have a people who stand before his throne without fault and without guile in their mouth. And now is it time for us to develop that character to be there amongst those people. In the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, let's turn there, Zephaniah. We're turning to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13. Zephaniah 3 and verse 13, we, we see this very similar language as what was used in Revelation 14 and verse 5. And the remnant of Israel, friends, are we the remnant of Israel? We are God's remnant people, and we should present to the world what the remnant really is. The remnant of Israel shall do no iniquity, or the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in the mouth. 
for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Friends, we are told again and again that God's remnant people do no iniquity. Now, if you're struggling with sin at this time, I'm not saying that you are not part of God's remnant. God is still working with us to overcome these things, but friends, if you are willfully going against God's word, if we are willfully putting ourselves in a position and trying to deceive ourselves into believing that we will still be saved in those sins, we are disqualifying ourselves from being a part of God's remnant people. In Psalms chapter 119, let us turn there. Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We're looking at verses 1 through 3. Psalms 119, verses 1 through 3. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You see, sin is the transgression of God's law. As we, as we were covering this morning in Sabbath school, sin is the transgression of God's law. And those who abide in his law will not be found in transgression to that law. Turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Getting ready to close out. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 1. What does the word of God tell us? 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. You see, it is by holding on to these promises in God's word. It is by having faith in these promises and utilizing these promises practically that we are to be transformed in character and mind. As we are told, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. Amen? That transformation comes as the mind changes and all things will follow what the mind follows. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If we can learn to change the way we think by allowing the word of God to shape our thoughts, we will be put in a position where our physical characters will begin to change. Amen? Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 and 4. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by what? By these promises. That by these promises you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Friends, we can be partakers of that divine nature. The same divine nature that was combined and linked to Christ's humanity that kept him at every step from yielding to temptation. We can have that same divine nature that will cause us to rise above temptation and the dark things of this world. In Review and Herald, February 18th, 1890. Men may have a power to resist evil, a power that neither earth nor death nor hell can master, a power that will place them where they, where they may be overcome, where they may overcome as Christ overcame. Divinity and humanity may be combined in them. Was divinity and humanity combined in Christ? Absolutely. And it was that divinity that was combined with his humanity that gave him success in his warfare against Satan. And if we have access to that same divine nature that Christ had, what excuse can we give him in the judgment for not overcoming sin as he did? 
every mouth will be silenced when we try to come up with some excuse as to why we did not overcome. Last statement is from Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. And I could just hear the love and the longing in Christ's heart as he says these words. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, that means there is no sin amongst us. That means that we are reflecting his beautiful image fully. When that time comes, Christ can look down from his sanctuary and say, now it is safe for me to close the sanctuary and to come back for my people because now they are ready to stand in the sight of God without a mediator, without an intercessor. Let that be our goal. Let that be what we strive towards. And let us spend extra time in God's word during this lockdown. Amen.